That's the chime, so you know the time, faithful listener. G-Man here. I, for one, am looking forward to turning the tables on these bastards. Come on, what are you waiting for? The last days of war. You never told us what he was doing that day for Phillips. When this is over, I want answers. First monsters, then dark tunnels. Now devils and cults are at the doorstep of Evansburg's finest killers. It wasn't long ago they thought they had won the war. They thought their fight was over and their city could have peace. But the signs were always there. Whether they missed them or ran from them, the ridden were never done. The tunnels emerged, the mutations multiplied, and now, before knowing it, they're in a war that's evolved past anything they could have imagined. The question we have to ask ourselves is are we paying attention? Because everything points to the future, and our future is a river of blood. Welcome everyone, I'm Darkstar HC, and this is the story of Children of the Worm. Watch my video on the Back for Blood story so far if you need to catch up because we don't want to waste any time getting into Children of the Worm and everything we need to understand to be ready for River of Blood. But to make sure we're all up to speed, here's what you need to know. A mysterious parasite called the Devil Worm has wiped out most of the world's population during an event known as the Collapse by killing and reanimating humans into Ridden. In our setting of Evansburg, General Phillips is the founder and leader of Fort Hope, humanity's best chance against the Ridden, and with the help of the Worm Immune and Battle Ready Cleaners, he's declared a war against the Ridden and constantly works to develop strategies and weapons against them. That brings us to The Resurgence, the event that kicks off Act 1 a year after the Collapse, and is actually important for understanding what's happening now in Children of the Worm. At the resurgence, humanity went from thinking the Ridden were almost gone to getting overrun by armies of them like never before. It left Fort Hope faced with a war on two fronts. Ridden hordes originating from the Blue Dog Mine in the north had already overrun the Diner Outpost, meanwhile entirely different hordes had overrun Wren's Outpost just south of the Kanoa River. Knowing he needed to regroup his defense, General Phillips decided to call back his cleaners from Wren's Outpost and blow the bridge reaching across the river, cutting off the Ridden and any contact with Kanoa County. While the southern attack remained a mystery, Phillips knew that the attack from the mine was the result of a failed experiment by a secret researcher, Dr. Rogers, to perfect a ridden killing chemical formula. Phillips' priority was to secure Fort Hope and dispatch a soldier team to secretly retrieve Rogers and get him to safety. As Phillips and the cleaners continued to battle with Dr. Rogers' formula and its consequences, it was all too easy to forget about the spontaneous ridden onslaught south of the river and the masses of ridden left there. Since then, underground tunnels have revealed themselves all over Evansburg, containing massive ridden hives hidden underground. The cleaners have fought tirelessly to keep back any emerging threats and quell these hives festering below. Their mistake was to think these tunnels were random, that the hives were revealing themselves by accident, and that these labyrinths of interconnected tunnels led to nothing more than nests and loot. The ridden across the river that everyone forgot about they decided if they can't go over the river, then they'll tunnel under it. Proving once again that you can run from them, but you can't hide and you definitely can't rest. And the worst threats to come through are just arriving. Someone else is arriving as well. Knock, knock. A new visitor to Fort Hope looking for help. He's a troublemaker and a zealot and Phillips arrests him and brings him in for questioning. So tell me. What did you see out there? His name is Dan, but asserts he'd be called Prophet. Dan is an ex carny now charismatic religious leader who used his skills to amass a following after the collapse. Dan calls his followers his flock, and they had survived until recently. Dan describes them as being taken by devils corrupted by the darkness and worshipping an evil false god. While Dan mostly speaks in theatrical sermons, this description still seems uncharacteristic to any mindless ridden Phillips has ever encountered. Furthermore, these kidnappings line up with past reports of disappearances in the Kanoa County area. Never one for sitting idle, Phillips tells Dan that they'll get his followers back. 
For Phillips, it's the perfect opportunity to investigate the potential threats to the South and stop them before they come to Fort Hope. He also determines that Dan's apparent worm immunity and special set of skills make him a valuable asset and releases him to work alongside the cleaners. Phillips dispatches a cleaner team to head into Kanoa County, and without a bridge to get there, the cleaners head to the nearby marina to take a boat across. They land at the Kanoa County Correctional Facility where Phillips believes the prisoners are being held. In fact, he corrects himself on the radio after saying, we believe, which may suggest Phillips is keeping a secret source of information. The cleaners advance expecting another mission of rescuing civilians from nests. They could have never prepared for what meets their advance because it changes the entire war. This war is no longer human versus ridden. It's human versus something else. That something else is fighting alongside the ridden. Their eyes glow like them, their skin is discolored and changed, but they can still talk. They're speaking fanatical nonsense about worms and flesh and mothers, but they're still talking. And it seems, at least, like the devil worms are strengthening their bodies instead of killing and animating them. The cleaners don't have time to react and just get themselves to the entrance of the prison. Over the radio, Phillips reveals that he had suspicions that they would face a new threat, and to say the cleaners are angry is an understatement. But Phillips keeps their focus on rescuing the prisoners and making it back out. However, venturing further into the prison only puts them deeper into the rabbit hole they just discovered. These new enemies have created an entire religious ideology around the worm and their condition. They all seem to worship a mother with all of them as her children. And it's clear why they're choosing to kidnap people and bring them here. New children are created through a sadistic ritual in which the prisoners are offered to the worms and either painfully killed or successfully transformed. This transformation is meant to wipe the memories of the victim, priming them for indoctrination. Thus, cultists are born, empowered by the worms and compelled by the cult. They take up flaming arrows, iron claws, and sniper rifles and charge into the fight with the zeal of the devout and the promise of paradise. Stomping through the ritual rooms and evading countless traps, the cleaners take down the cultists one by one. They make it to the first cell block and free the prisoners, sending them back through the front. The cleaners then fall through the floor into the next cell block made cage for an ogre. Narrowly escaping through the back exit, they run straight into a cult-made arena. Already well used, this arena probably has enough festering nest material to cultivate dozens of mutations. Then suddenly, that becomes the least of their problems. A voice hijacks their radio, and this mission instantly turns into the most important mission of the war. Because this voice both sends a chill through their bodies and gives them the most powerful weapon against the Ridden they've ever had. <laughs> Not so fast, little rats. We shall use your blood and your bones to strengthen our creation your maze run ends here the mother of worms isn't a vague deity the cult believes in she's right here she just overtook the cleaners radio locked them in a death arena and taunts them of all the questions that are immediately raised who is she what can she do are the cleaners about to die one point of clarity cuts through it all they now have an enemy. Not endless hordes of their dead neighbors, not mindless hungry monsters or brainwashed rambling cultists. There's a single enemy they can stare in the face. There's someone controlling the cult, maybe even controlling ridden attacks and tunnels and who knows what else. Now they know. And she better hope they don't get out alive. In the last possible moments, help emerges. The floor of the arena opens up and someone pulls the cleaners into an underground safe room. This someone introduces himself as Derek, and surprisingly, he seems to be a cultist. In appearance, at least, but his mind is fully intact. He wants to get away from the cult and he wants them taken down, but he won't leave without his sister, Tala, who's still trapped somewhere in the prison. Concerned now with getting out alive with their newfound knowledge of the enemy, the cleaners promise they'll be back for Derek and Tala. 
Derek tells the cleaners how they can escape using connected tunnels and mines and some dynamite to blast through the collapsed exit at the end. Separating from Derek, the cleaners find that these mines have actually been dug out by the Ridden, most likely at the command of the cult. To what end isn't clear. The cleaners make it to the tunnel's exit and are surprised to find that Derek has also found his way onto their secure radio channel. He tells them about a truck they can use for an escape located in a nearby mine accessible from the surface by an elevator. The cleaners find that to get there, they need to fight their way through a full-blown fortress constructed by the cult. If this isn't their headquarters, this place is very important to them. The cleaners descend in the elevator, survive an ambush, and find the truck waiting for them, but to their surprise, they also find more prisoners kept in cages all around this mine. In one heroic moment, they decide they can't leave yet. They have more people to save and set out to start freeing the prisoners. But then, they find something that both confirms their suspicions and their nightmares. This fortress is protecting something very important and the prisoners aren't here to become cultists. They're here as food. Waiting just beyond these mines is something so monstrous, the caverns churn and rumble with its restless movements. Something so powerful, it's breached the deepest chasm the cleaners have ever seen and something so evil, it glows with the luminescence of thousands of devil worms. The cult made this fortress to nourish it, sacrifice to it, even worship it. Suddenly, it's hard to fault Phillips for constantly concocting dangerous weapons behind the scenes because the Ridden have been doing the same thing all along. Once the prisoners are freed, the cleaners get one last idea. They can't leave this fortress, this horror inside it, without at least taking a swing. The cult has been stockpiling dynamite, and although it's risky, the cleaners decide to set explosive charges on the dynamite stores in the hopes it'll blow the whole place sky high. They pull off their plan despite the swarms of ridden and cultists that rush to stop them and make it back to the truck. Hauling the freed prisoners along with them, they outrun the explosions and make it out just in time to see the whole place burn. With radio communications to Fort Hope restored, Phillips receives confirmation that the mission is complete and responds with a promise that the fight is just getting started. A fortress of hope against a cult of devils. The rescue mission may have turned into a series of traps and desperate escapes, but hope is now armed with dangerous knowledge. The Ridden are being controlled. If the Mother of Worms is making moves, then that means Phillips can make counter moves. There's no telling how much she could be behind. The tunnels, the blue dog mine, the abomination. And if the cult can control the Ridden, does that mean humans could too? And how has Derek kept his mind after being transformed? Is it possible to restore other cultists? The cultists speak of the mark of the mother that protects them against all evil. Could this be a mark that keeps the ridden from attacking them? And can it be used by humans? These are just some of the questions Fort Hope gets to mull over as it gears up for its next attack. In an ironic twist, it's Tala, Derek's sister, that escapes and finds the cleaners. Another former cultist, Tala's already made progress on figuring out how to control the Ridden and teaches the cleaners how to do it with high frequency sounds. We know Tala hates the cult and wants to rescue her brother and we'll have to find out where her priorities lie after that. Noticeably, her eyes aren't glowing and her skin isn't discolored, which would suggest she originally experienced an extremely partial transformation or she's found a way to reject the worms and transition back. The very first thing practically every cleaner seems to find important at the start of Act 5 is a large channel that has collapsed into the street. With no apparent follow-up to this phenomenon, it's worth wondering if more channels like these will form to make our rivers of blood coming in our future. The missions to come will be dubbed No Sanctuary, Emergency Broadcast, Grim Discovery, The Waterfront, and Behold the Harbinger. Now, this is speculation, but if I was to forebode no relief for our cleaners, I would say it sounds like they may not make it right back to Fort Hope after Act 5. After all, they can't exactly drive a truck through the Kanoa River. No sanctuary would suggest they don't make it to safety. And the image we have of the campaign shows a boat that looks like the one we used to get across the river in the first place. 
and it looks like by the time we get to the water, we may be met with the monster we awakened in the mine, called the Harbinger. The cultists keep referring to the four that will rise again. The best guess we have right now is that this refers to the Mother of Worms, the Abomination, also known as the King, the Harbinger, and some fourth thing. But it could be four things we haven't even heard of yet. And given the meaning of the word harbinger, there may be something much more sinister just around the corner. The cult is revealed. The war is on and nothing brings together soldiers like a singular enemy. But even though Fort Hope may be gearing up, it now has to deal with retaliation as cultists invade North Evansburg through the tunnels. And if Phillips can't get his cleaners back from Kanoa with the freed prisoners, then he may be missing a large part of his cleaner force and the support of Dan and Dan's followers. Time will tell if Hope can capitalize on the new intel and develop ways to control the Ridden, outmaneuver the cult, and take out its leadership, or if the Mother of Worms' secret plans are too far in motion to be stopped. Whatever happens, it's obvious that this time is different. We have a clear mission ahead of us. We want blood. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for stopping by. Subscribe if you think you'd like to come back, and leave a like if you think more people should check it out. Follow me on Twitch to know when I'm going live and discovering all my Back for Blood content in real time, and join my Discord if you're interested in discussing the story or getting into some games. I'll see you all in the next one. Lots of love, lots of gaming, and lots of blood. Thanks everyone. You know what that sound means? Oh yeah, it's J-Man time. I get tired up here sometimes. I haven't been sleeping like I used to. You get that, listener, don't you? Yeah, who sleeps these days? Hard to get some shut-eye with those things howling out there in the dark.